Good evening and welcome to RASC Toronto Centre. We are online and I am Dr. Elena Hyde, the second vice president of RASC Toronto Centre. This is our October Speakers Night presentation. So very exciting times. Happy October, everyone. This is actually one of two types of gatherings that we have online these days, not at the Ontario Science Centre due to the pandemic. Uh, later on this evening, our president, Tom Luton, will be talking about our various programs but first, we have a few things to uh, kick off. To start, I'd actually like to go ahead and acknowledge that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre meets on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishabi peoples. These lands are part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. As we engage in astronomy here together, we respect from and honour the deep relationship between Indigenous peoples, the sky, and the earth. So as a way to get started off today, I have to go ahead and begin by introducing our absolutely fabulous for you here tonight. Um, I'm super excited, so let's see if I can get through the whole introduction. Uh, Dr. Keith Hawkins is actually joining us from the University of Texas at Austin, uh, the Galactic Archaeology Lab, and um, all kinds of other glorious things, actually. He's an assistant professor in astronomy, received his PhD from the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, UK, and he's also a member of the newly created Wooten Center for Astrophysical Plasma Properties, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, at UT Austin. His research is in using multi-object spectroscopic surveys to understand some of the wonderful properties of galaxies. And this is actually going to fall under the really cool title of Galactic Archaeology. He leads the Galactic Archaeology Lab. And of course, his group uh, does all kinds of great things. One is called Chemical fingerprinting, which I won't spoil for you here, but it's just as awesome as it sounds. So one of my favorite papers from their group was actually come out rather recently, the stars of the Het Dex survey, which I highly recommend reading. Super fun if you love that kind of thing. Um, and he has a lot of other hats as well. He's done outreach, he's done teaching, he's a professor, researcher, and of course, a little bit of a galaxy structure detective. And since galaxy structure has always been one of my favorite topics, I am really, really pleased to have him here tonight. So Dr. Hawkins, please take it away and tell us just how does one dust through all the artifacts in galactic archeology span of the stars? Awesome, thank you. Can everyone, I hope people can hear me. Um, so, awesome. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Keith Hawkins. Um, you know, thank you for the very kind introduction of that. Um, I am very delighted to be with all of you tonight. And so the work that I do in here in Texas is on galactic archaeology. And it's, it's a fun little uh, title, but you'll see what I mean in, in a couple of slides here, uh, what galactic archaeology really is all about, and, and particularly using it um, to uncover the story of our home with stellar fossils. And I always start with this beautiful image uh, in the background, which is the um, 2.1 meter telescope at McDonald Observatory uh, in West Texas. So UT Austin is uh, the one of the primary leaders of that particular observatory. And one of the wonderful things as an astronomer that I get to do is I get to go out to this telescope and observe the night sky and observe uh, this milky band of stars that we'll call the Milky Way. And so let's jump right into it. Uh, I generally, whenever I start a public lecture, I, I like to ask people questions. And I like to get people thinking, you know, when you look up, what do you see? And it varies from place to place. Um, when I, you know, before I moved to the University of Texas, I actually was a postdoctoral research fellow at Columbia University in New York City. If you go in New York City and you ask this very question, you'll get a very different answer uh, than if someone lives in a rural community. Uh, most people in New York will just say, yeah, I just, you know, I see Times Square or I see the lights of New York. Uh, and yet, if you go out to a really dark sky, McDonald Observatory is an example of this, but any real uh, dark sky observatory, you might see something that looks like this. And so if you let your eyes dark adjust, you'll see this beautiful milky band 
of stars across the night sky. You'll see stars, of course, outside of the Milky Band. Each dot of light here is a star, in fact, but you'll see a Milky Band of stars. And so this, um, in this image, you have stars, you have dust. A lot of people don't realize this, but if you look closely at the Milky Way, this is the Milky Way here in the background, um, you will see these dark patches. And those dark patches are not the absence of stars. There are actually stars there. Uh, it's just that there's so much dust in the way of us and the star that we can't actually see behind the dust. And so the analogy that I like to give, the terrestrial analogy that I like to give, is kind of a little bit of a gross analogy, but imagine you take an old dirty rug and you and, a, and another person, your, your best friend, is shaking out this rug and it gets so dusty when, you're the, rug, when the rug is, is being shaken up that you can't see behind. You can't see the person behind it. And that's kind of akin to what's going on in our galaxy. There's so much dust, especially towards the central regions, you just can't see behind the dust. There's also gas and cats and dogs and humans and so forth. And it's uh, this, this, um, this band of, this milky band of stars is called the Milky Way. Um, and um, it is made of about 100 to 200 billion stars like our sun. And as a galactic archeologist, my goal is to use our galaxy as a laboratory to answer fundamental questions about how galaxies in general form. So these questions include things like, how do galaxies and their stars form? Um, we know that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the only one out there. There's plenty of galaxies out there. But we, have, we still have very little um, clear ideas about how the galaxies in the universe actually form. We don't know how they evolve either. How, so how do galaxies evolve? That's still a question we're asking today in modern astronomy. How do galaxies assemble themselves over cosmic time? So we know that galaxies merge and meld and do all kinds of interesting things. A little bit you'll learn in this talk. And how galaxies evolve on and assemble themselves on cosmic time, well, we're still trying to figure that out as well. And then finally, some of the big questions that we have are, well, what is the important physics? What is the physical processes involved in galaxy formation? Is gravity really important? Or maybe it's dark matter, or maybe it's dark energy, or and so forth. So these are the types of questions that we get to ask. And one of the reasons why I absolutely love my job is that I get paid to, to ask these questions and to try and figure out and to be on the, the very pinnacle of human knowledge in, certain, in terms of answering some of these questions. And I should admit, these are these are very difficult, you know, th these are four very broad questions, but they're very difficult to answer. And to answer them, you can, you know, many astronomers go out to other galaxies and try to look at other galaxies and try to figure out how they have form and evolve. But as a galactic archaeologist, my goal is to answer this question or answer these questions, if you will, uh, using our galaxy, the Milky Way, as a laboratory for doing this. So we often call this galactic archaeology, and I'll describe a little bit about why that is in a moment. Um, but in general, um, every star in the night sky is a fossil, and so that's it's a fossil record of what, what has happened in the early universe. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is the case, but that's why we call this galactic archaeology. And so luckily, the night sky is full of these fossils, 100 to 200 billion of them, drawing out this beautiful band of stars called the Milky Way. So this is actually the Milky Way. This is a, an image of the Milky Way taken from a set of telescopes that I've actually used in uh, Chile called the VLT. Um, we're great at naming things in astronomy. These telescopes are called the Very Large Telescope. Wonderful. Um, and so this talk is really about the Milky Way and about what we can learn about the Milky Way using galactic archaeology. So let's go ahead and explore it. So what you're looking at here is the best artist's impression that we have of our home, the Milky Way. And so um, it is a beautiful, beautiful galaxy, barred spiral galaxy. I should you know, really want to emphasize here, this is an artist impression. Um, we've never, human beings have never gotten far enough outside of our galaxy to take an image of it. So we don't really know what it looks like from this projection because we just haven't got that far. In fact, humans haven't even got really as far as the outer solar system or just beyond the solar system. The Voyager spacecrafts have just left the solar system quite recently. And so even, and even though they've been traveling since the 1970s, so um, the likelihood of getting an image like this anytime soon is, is very small. Um, 
And so this is our, what we think our galaxy looks like. It's a barred spiral galaxy. It's the reason why we call it a barred spiral is because there's a bar here in the central regions. And then these beautiful spiral arms coming off of the bar. And the sun actually exists about two thirds of the way out, um, about two thirds of the way out uh, of the galactic center. And we're on an orbit that's about 228,000 light years away from the center. So light, can, light is traveling incredibly fast, it's about 186,000 miles per second. Um, and it can uh, circle the earth about, of order about seven times in a second. And even though light is incredibly fast, it still takes light 28,000 years to traverse the space between the center of our galaxy and where we currently are today. Um, in addition to that, we orbit, we, get, we orbit around the galaxy kind of like the Earth orbits around the sun. Um, but our um, galactic year, if you will, that is how long does it take the sun to go, to go all the way around the galaxy once? It's about 230 million years. Um, to an astronomer, that's a really short period of time, but to most people, it's a very long period of time. Um, this is about the last time, uh, this is about around the time that dinosaurs uh, were, were kind of walking the Earth is when the sun was in the, la was in the where the sun was uh, last in, in its orbit. Um, and so this is just showing you, as, um, you know, galaxies as a whole, or at least as we know them, come in all kinds of flavors and shapes. Um, and this is uh, how we classify galaxies based on something called the Hubble tuning fork. It's based on Edwin Hubble, who's pictured here with his black cat. And you've got elliptical galaxies that are nothing more than elliptical blobs. They're spheroids of galaxies, of stars. Then you've got the spirals, um, and the spirals really exist in two flavors, just normal spirals that just have regular spiral arms and barred spirals that have this bar at the center with these beautiful spiral arms coming out of it. And our galaxy here is, is a barred spiral galaxy. Um, to orient you a little bit more in terms of our galaxy and how it's structured, um, I put a little cartoon here about um, how the galaxy is structured. So you've got the sun, we've got a thin disk, a thicker disk around the thin disk, a bulge in the central region, which is where our uh, galactic bar is, and a halo surrounding it. And I'll walk through each of these components one by one, just to give you a little bit of an understanding of them. And we'll start with the thin disk. And I want to mention as well, um, I'm, I'm the kind of person that I really, really like food. So I'm going to give an analogy to our galaxy and how it's structured using breakfast food, since breakfast just happens to be my favorite meal. And so the thin disk of our galaxy is rotationally supported, which basically means that all of the stars are going around in beautiful, wonderful circular orbits, mostly. Uh, it's kinematically cold, we call it, which just means that all the stars in the, in the thin disk, generally speaking, are going around not quite in perfect circles, but almost. And most of them are going around almost in perfect circles. And it's a pretty young component of our galaxy. It's about zero to eight billion years. I would consider eight billion years relatively young. Um, and it's fairly metal rich. So it's about, how, most of the stars in our uh, thin disk have about half to three times the amount of iron that our sun has. And it's incredibly thin in terms of its aspect ratio. So the, I've compared it up here um, in breakfast food to a French crepe. It's incredibly thin, incredibly long. And in fact, our sun, which is only about four and a half billion years old, um, is living right now inside of the thin disk of our galaxy. Then you've got the thick disk. And the thick disk was actually discovered in other galaxies before it was discovered in our own. And um, in the breakfast analogy, imagine you have your, you know, your flat, your, your, um, your very thin crepe, and you surround that crepe with a nice, fat, thick American pancake, which is pictured here. That's at the thick disk. And the thick disk was actually discovered in the 1980s uh, by this guy pictured here, Jerry Gilmore, and Gilmore and Reed in 1983. And in fact, Jerry Gilmore was my PhD advisor. And the reason why, part of the reason why I went to Cambridge to get trained is because Jerry was my PhD advisor. Um, much like the thin disk of our galaxy, the thin disk, the thick disk is rotationally supported. And that just means that again, all the stars are going around and, and around and around and around the disk. Um, but it's kinematically hotter. And what, we, what I mean by that is some, essentially that instead of all the stars nicely going around in relatively circular orbits, these stars are kind of going around, but they've got orbits that are tilted. They're kind of moving around in these elliptical ways. They're not as circular, if you will, as the thin disk. 
And the Thictus is quite a bit older um, than the thin disc. It likely formed earlier, it likely formed first, and it was it's about eight to 13 billion years old. Now for reference, our universe is about 13.7-ish billion years old. And the stars in the thin thick disc are generally not as metal rich as the sun. Um, they're usually one tenth to about one times the amount of iron in the sun. And it will be obvious in a couple of slides, I hope at least it'll be obvious in a couple of slides why that is the case. Okay, and so then the, the, the next component is the stellar halo. Um, in our breakfast food analogy, imagine, right, you've got your French crop, that's our thin disc. You've got your fat American pancakes surrounding it, that's our thick disc. And then imagine in the, like probably one of the most unhealthy ways, you batter that up and you deep fry it. And the deep fried batter on the outskirts, that's our stellar halo. And the stellar halo is basically on the outskirts of the galaxy. And generally speaking, stars are not moving in circular orbits. They're moving all over the place. They're moving really fast. They're moving in random ways. It's in fact, it's one of the oldest components in our galaxy. It's about 10 billion years or older for most of the stars. And many of the stars are actually extremely metal poor. It means that they have almost no metal in them. They can have 0.0000001 to about one-tenth the iron content of our sun. And they're also, well, we don't know, but um, there's still kind of debates going on in astronomy about whether the halo is made of multiple components or not, an, an inner part that's made of uh, mostly material that has um, potentially accreted onto the Milky Way or may have uh, just been here already, or an outer part that may have just been formed from accretion. And so that's something we'll talk a little bit about later on. And then the final component of our galaxy is the galactic bulge. So now let's imagine, right, you, in our breakfast analogy, we've got our cre French crepe surrounded by a fat American pancake, surrounded by a deep fried battered um, mess. And then you put a big glob of butter in the middle. And that big glob of butter is nothing more than our galactic bulge. And in the bulge, stars are moving all over the place. They're moving very random in very fast ways. Um, and um, the component is very old. It's about 8 to 12 billion years old. So not as not quite as old as the halo, but pretty old nonetheless. We don't know, but we think there are probably at least five various components that make up the galactic bar and bulge that are um, uh, probably likely, you know, based on how it was actually formed. And generally speaking, many of the stars are quite metal rich. You know, they're about one to maybe five times that of so of the iron content of the sun, but some are also metal poor. And the bulge is very difficult to understand because there's a lot of dust towards the center of it. And it's only until really recently that we've been able to get a much clearer picture of the galactic bulge. So that's the cartoon version of our galaxy. This is what it looks like. This is the best state of the art image that we have to date of our galaxy, the Milky Way. These two little itty bitty things on this down here, this is the large and the small Magellanic clouds. These are actually other galaxies outside of our Milky Way that the Milky Way is currently gobbling up. So we've got our bulge, again, that's the bulge in the galactic center. Um, all of this dust is the reason why the bulge has been really hard to, to really get a good picture of rec until relatively recently because you need infrared telescopes to be able to get to peer back behind that dust and infrared technology really has become advanced enough in the last probably decade or so that we've been able to peer into the bulge. You've got the thin disk, the thick disk, and the halo on the outskirts. And so this uh, is our home. This is our galaxy, the Milky Way. A galaxy made up of stars, of beautiful lanes of dust, and of gas as well. And so one of the fundamental questions that I ask as a galactic astronomer, as a galactic archaeologist, is well, how in the heck do you form our galaxy and its constituent stars? We know that there's a galaxy, we can see it. We know that there are stars because we can see them, but how do they actually form? And so in the next couple of slides, I'll give you a little bit of a flavor about how we think these two things form. So first we'll start with stars because they're a little easier and then we'll talk about the galaxy as a whole. So the way we think stars form is you start out with a big, big, big gas cloud of molecular hydrogen gas. And it's really cold. And 
as the gas cloud gets larger and larger, at some point, gravity will begin to pull all the material together. It's the same force that's pulling our feet and our um, feet to the ground right now is the same force that is responsible for starting the formation of stars. And so the gas cloud basically, this is um, shown here in part A, in part B, the gas clouds collapse due to gravity. And as they collapse, um, the gas gets closer and closer together and suddenly it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And finally in part C, as the gas cloud collapses and gets hotter and co continues collapsing and gets, continues to get hotter, it finally gets so hot that the hydrogen atoms within that gas cloud can fuse and attach to each other to form heavier elements like helium, which is the next element on the periodic table. And so that's when the star is born. That's part D and part E. So that's depicting that when the, ga when the gas cloud is forming, forming or condensing, condensing, condensing and heating up and it's about to form its star. In addition to that, any debris, any dust or debris that's in, around the star will actually spin and form a disk around that's called a debris disk. And as the star finally turns on, that debris disk will actually, um, you know, there's little dust particles in that debris disk that will stick together. Other dust particles will stick together making pebbles and the pebbles will stick together making boulders and the boulders will stick together making even larger things until you get planets. And so that's how you get planets is that you basically take these, this dusty debris disk of material around the newly forming star, you stick a bunch of stuff together due to gravity and you finally get planets on the outside. And then you're finally left with a star and a solar system of planets like our own. Um, but at least what we know up to now is that stars generally don't form one at a time. They usually will form in clusters at a time. And an example of this is one of the, this is one of the most beautiful open clusters that we see today, the Seven Sisters, as it's often called in amateur astronomy, or the Pleiades open cluster. And so these Pleiades, clus this Pleiades cluster are, is a new set of stars that have just formed and it likely formed from a beautiful large gas cloud that contracted and formed stars. Now, generally speaking, astronomers used to think or thought up until relatively recently that stars will generally form in these relatively loose bounds called open clusters, like the Seven Sisters, like shown here. There's relatively spherical bound structures. Um, and then they'll just dissolve over time. And so our sun probably was born in one of these clusters. And then those, then those stars experienced forces that caused the stars to evaporate away from the cluster, like our sun. However, um, this was this is a picture that was kind of formed and early on and, and um, you know, even up until very recently, this is how we thought stars formed. But incredibly recently, over the last maybe year or two, the Gaia spacecraft, um, the ESA Gaia spacecraft has allowed us to map the galaxy in full detail um, or in quite a lot of detail, actually, for, for um, a billion, about a billion stars, about 1.8 billion stars. And so in doing that, many people have started to find that there are these beautiful, and so this is a, um, a showing, a, um, a, which you might see in a planetarium, this is the Gaia spacecraft, and each one of these little colored blobs that are coming up is a very young association of new stars. And what we're finding is that they're not necessarily spherical. You can actually find these long, very long tails, long strings of stars that are, for in astronomy speak, we, we say that they're about 400 parsecs long, or in non-astronomy speak, we say that they're about 1,300 light years long. This, they're kind of like these long cigar-shaped structures of stars, of very young stars. And so this called into question how stars form. Do they form in these spherical like blobs called stellar, um, stellar clusters, or are they form, formed in these filament-like strings called stellar strings? And that's something that my group has worked on. And, and I don't know if I'll have time to, to get into the result, but suffice to say, we're starting to realize that we, we actually do think that, you know, this picture of stars forming from these large gas clouds condensing, we think that's largely correct, but there's another form of that, which is that stars form in these very massive, uh, very long stellar filaments. Regardless of how the stars form though, um, the chemistry, the chemical DNA, the chemical inventory, if you will, of a star doesn't generally change over the course of its life. 
And so if I look up and I see a star that's say 10 billion years old, then I'm seeing whatever the gas of the universe is doing 10 billion years ago in terms of its chemistry. So this concept is, we actually see this concept regularly here on earth. Um, there's two terrestrial examples I'll give. The first is when folks go to ice to, to Antarctica, they dig up ice cores and in those ice cores are an early Earth's atmosphere trapped in these little bubbles. And in fact, we can actually get quite a good understanding of the early Earth just on the basis of studying the little bubbles trapped in the ice core. It's a similar concept with stars. The other way I like to explain this, at least in a ter ter terrestrial way, is imagine um, you go to a DNA um, company, you get your DNA read, and they can tell you that 50% of your ancestors came from one place and 50% of your ancestors came from another place. We can also do that with stars because the chemical makeup of the star is kind of like its DNA and all of the stars that form together likely share the same DNA. That's called chemical tagging. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of slides. So that's how we think stars form and why stars are interesting and important, at least for galactic archeology. span but how are galaxies formed? This is a very difficult question. And one that I've been racking my head about for, uh, you know, ever since I entered this field, but to be fair, human beings have been racking, our, this, racking around this question for you know, millennia. And the answer to this depends on who you talk to. If you talk to someone in classics, someone who studies literature or other cultures, anthropology, for example, they'll tell you something very different than what a scientist would tell you. And the reason why I start in this, I start with this is because when I was an undergraduate, I actually have a second degree in African studies. I went to Ghana, taught middle school, and also did what's called ethnoastronomy and studied the, how culture sees the skies. And I really like this story that summed up how did our galaxy formed in a beautiful um, uh, kind of proverb, if you will, that sometimes it really does take a village to make a galaxy. And I recounted this story, actually, I got a wonderful opportunity to go back to my alma mater, Ohio University, and give the spring commencement, university-wide commencement address in 2021. And so I recounted the story of how the galaxy formed from a Cherokee legend. So the Cherokee legend starts in a small town of how the galaxy formed, starts in a small town uh, with more or less a mom and pop. And, and this in this Cherokee tribe, in this town, uh, the mom and pop were responsible for milling corn into cornmeal for the winter. And as they would mill the corn into cornmeal, they would store it in uh, these large bags in a tucked away shed so that they had it for the winter. Now, one day they came out and they were horrified to learn that there was a, someone was going into the shed and stealing all of the cornmeal they were milling. And when they looked at the prints left behind by the culprit, it was paw prints of a dog, but it wasn't normal paw prints. It was the biggest dog you probably ever could imagine in your life. And they called this the sp a spirit dog. And so the townsfolk all decided, okay, we really need our food for the winter. So they banded together and they stayed up one night waiting for the spirit dog to come back. And once the spirit dog came back, they all in unison banged their noisemakers so loud, they scared the spirit dog um, and it ran into the sky with a bag of cornmeal and that left behind cornmeal, that trail of cornmeal is now called the Milky Way. And so um, this, this is a nice story in some sense because it not just describes a cultural way behind how the galaxy formed, but also describes, I think, a really great proverb that it does take a village. Now, of course, that's not how the Milky Way actually formed. Um, I'll give you two basic scientific ideas behind how the Milky Way formed. And the first um, is this idea that came around in the late 1960s by Egan, Lyndon, Bell, and Sandage. So that's why it's called ELS for short. And it's the theory of so-called monolithic collapse. And the way that they thought galaxies formed is basically a larger scale version of how stars form. So I described stars form by taking a gas cloud, collapsing it, under gravity, it heats up, it forms a star. The idea that they had was, let's take that to one scale larger. Let's start with a really, 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 really big gas cloud. Let it collapse due to gravity. It will fragment into other small clumps of, of, of um, gas clouds that will form stars. So it'll fragment and form other stars. And you'll get a spherical blob of stars behind. That's called a galaxy. 
or an ellipt at least elliptical galaxy, as we said earlier on from the Hubble tuning fork. And so the, the question is, well, how do you get a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way out of this? And that's kind of hard to do in this, in this uh, mechanism. And so the way you do that is you start by giving that gas cloud a little bit of a spin at the beginning, kind of like this ice skater. If you give this ice skater a spin as she's spinning it up, um, when she drags her arms in, and that's, that's similar to the gas cloud collapsing, she spins up. And that's due to something called conservation of angular momentum. And so as this gas cloud collapses, it will spin up into a disk and create a disky galaxy. Um, this process is actually very similar to um, the way you might make pizza. If you start out with a pizza dough ball and you spin up that pizza dough, it will spin up into a disk that will create your pizza. And so it's the same type of a concept, but happening on a galactic scale. So this was the first idea, one of the early ideas behind how galaxies formed. And it was pretty good at um, explaining the observations, but it didn't quite fit all the observations. And so a new idea came out about 10 years later from Cyril and Zinn. And the idea was something called hierarchical, hierarchical galaxy formation. And this is a really just a fancy way of saying that galaxies, basically small proto galaxies that are pictured up here, they actually eat each other. So these two galaxies would eat each other and create this little galaxy that then would get eaten by this. These two galaxies would eat each other and form this larger structure. This process is called galactic cannibalism, where one galaxy goes and cannibalizes all the other galaxies nearby. And, and so these are the two primary ideas behind how galaxies form. And the modern story behind how galaxies form all are um, kind of, we can do this uh, in a much more sophisticated way now by computer simulations. And so this is a, a very nice simulation from Andrew Wetzel's work uh, from the Latte simulation. And what they do is they take all the physics that we know, all the information that we know, and they try to form a galaxy in a real simulation. So this is a galaxy forming in, our, in a simulation. Each one of these points of light is a star being born into existence. You've got these beautiful proto-galaxies that form, and then the proto-galaxies one by one are gonna be eaten by the central galaxy in the center. So one by one, the galaxy in the center is gonna start gobbling up all of the stuff nearby, creating a larger and larger structure. And so you can see evidence of this, um, this beautiful merger history out in the outskirts in, this, in the halo of this galaxy, because you can see beautiful shells and rings and streams of stars. There's a stream there, for example, or a ring of stars here that are caused by this very violent cannibalistic process. And so simulations show us that galactic cannibalism or creation can play a pretty big role actually in the assembly of our galaxy or galaxies like uh, the Milky Way. And so how do we learn the right answer between these two theories? Well, the way that we do it is we take um, a, we take an observation, um, or we, we, sorry, we take simulations and we try to simulate a galaxy and then we can compare those simulations to observations. Um, and then by comparing those simulations observations, we can actually try to figure out where, the where we went wrong in the simulations and we can tune the relevant physics uh, to match what we see in the real, in real life, in, in real observations. And so um, in, in, uh, generally in public lectures, I show this image here and I ask people to you know, figure out, well, which one do you think is a simulated galaxy and which one do you think is a real galaxy? And I promise you, this is not a trick question. In fact, the left side is a simulated galaxy and the right side is actually a real galaxy in real life that we've observed. And the point of this slide is just to show you that we've gotten very good at being able to simulate um, real galaxies. And so what we do as a, in, in galactic archeology span is we have astronomers that are primarily focused on the simulation side. Andrew West is a good example of this. And he'll go out and simulate galaxies with all the known physics and create um, fake galaxies that then we can fake observe. And then what I do is I actually go in and, to the, and compare uh, real data to those simulations. Um, and what I'm mostly interested in, in in the comparisons is in the chemical composition, the chemical DNA of a star, which raises the question, well, how do you measure the chemistry of a star? It can be really difficult. And the answer is actually uh, on, an, on a very nice album cover called The Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Um, this is an album cover of a very famous um, album. And it actually depicts how we measure stellar chemistry quite well. 
So imagine you have a sun or a star and that light from the star it looks white and then we pass it through a prism and you get the beautiful color spectrum, this Roy G. Biv, as we call it in school here in the United States. And so the thing is, if you look closely enough at, the, um, at this color spectrum of light coming from the star, which they don't show you in the Pink Floyd album cover, you'll see these dark bands that appear. And so this actually is another way of looking at our sun. This is taking sunlight and passing it through a prism. And so each one of these dark bands is an absorption feature caused by a specific element in the atmosphere of the sun. And so to someone who's trained, you can look at this and say, ah, oh, okay, this is hydrogen right now. This is hydrogen in the atmosphere of the sun. Oh, right, these two lines, one, two, that's sodium in the atmosphere of the sun. Oh yeah, and this one is magnesium in the atmosphere of the sun. And so you, to someone who's trained, every element has like a little, little signature in this particular spectrum. And so the size and depth and darkness of these dark bands allow us to determine how much of each element is in the atmosphere of the star. And luckily at University of Texas at Austin, I have access to these wonderful telescopes out in West Texas at the Donald Observatory. And we actually are one of the world leaders in doing exactly this. We do this one star at a time, but we've learned from this, um, we've learned from this process, um, you know, a lot about the universe and a lot about stars in the universe. And so um, one of the things that we've uh, been doing is, in, at least at Texas, is, um, you know, this, this type of thing, this doing this type of thing is called spectroscopy. And for a very long time, spectroscopy really, you had to do it one star at a time. So you'd send one star's light through a prism like this, and you would get its spectrum. Now imagine if there's a hundred billion stars in the galaxy, that's gonna take us quite a long time to get a good handle on what's going on in the galaxy. So we need a way to speed this up, not just doing it one star at a time. And the way we do that is through something called multi-object spectroscopic surveys. So this is an example of one of those surveys. This is um, the Hobby Everly Telescope at the University of Texas and the McDonald Observatory. It's one of the largest telescopes. I think it's the third largest telescope in the world. And um, what you don't, what you may not notice is that instead of having one spectrum, one spectrograph on the back of this telescope where we can just do one star at a time, we actually have these big black boxes on the side of the telescope. And in those boxes are fiber optic cables that go to 34,000 spectrographs. So we can actually take 34,000 spectra at, at any given time with every image that we take. And this allows us to speed up the process of mapping out the galaxy to a very, very high degree. And I just wrote a paper, as Anna was saying, on actually using these spectra from this very massively multiplex survey. Multiplex just means that instead of getting one star, we're getting 34,000. Um, we can actually do quite a lot with that. And so I, I really like to illustrate this in um, a slide like this, which is to, in to illustrate um, what it's like to move from just doing one star at a time, which we were doing in the 1950s all the way to the 2000s, to doing many, many stars at a time. And so what I often do is ask folks in the crowd, well, can you name what this painting is? This is a very famous painting, but I've undersampled it because we're not gonna be able to observe every star, so that's simulating that. And I've blocked out entire regions because they were just inaccessible uh, before because we were doing one star at a time. And so uh, if you try to figure this out, this answer out with today, uh, or sorry, um, from early 2000s, it would have been really difficult to know what painting this is. But today, because of the multi-object spectroscopic surveys, we've been able to um, get many, 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 many more stars than we've ever been able to get before. So instead of doing tens or hundreds of stars, we're now doing millions of stars. And this allows us to see this beautiful uh, picture. This is the starry night. I then go um, in all of its glory. Now, of course, it's still blurry because we have a lot of uncertainties and it's not fully sampled. But you know, in the 2030s, with GMT and other larger telescopes, we're going to we're going to be able to get not only many more stars, but also really shrink um, the error bars, really shrink um, and really get more precise um, abundances and more precise information about the stars, allowing us to see a much more granular picture of a starry night. And my hope is that in the far future, probably a little bit long after my career, uh, we'll be able to get the full picture of our galaxy to Milky Way. 
And so my group uses both traditional methods, which is going one star at a time, as well as industrial methods, which are going many, many stars at a time, uh, to answer key questions about galaxy formation. And um, with the remaining time that I have, I really only have time to answer one of these questions. We answer lots of questions. This is uh, my research group, the Galactic Archaeology Lab, um, pictured below at the University of Texas. And we try to answer all kinds of questions like, does chemical tagging really work? Do stars form in spherical or open clusters? Um, what are the origin of the fastest stars in the galaxy? And all kinds of things. But I'm only gonna talk about one of those things. Does chemical tagging work for the remaining time that I have? And so tagging, chemical tagging particularly, is, is a method that we can use uh, to figure out where a star was born on the basis of its chemical fingerprint alone. That's the idea of chemical tagging. So imagine, if you will, being able to take any star in the night sky, go out and measure its detailed chemistry and say, ah, this star came from exactly this location. This star was born in this location. Because if we can do that, that we can basically run the clock backwards and figure out how the galaxy formed. So the, 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 this is very akin to, for example, imagine, right, we can take the DNA of every human being on planet Earth, and if we can tell X percent of your ancestors come from this place and X percent of your ancestors come from, say, Africa or Asia or Europe, then we can track how humans have migrated over time. And so this is the exact same concept, but applied to uh, stellar astronomy. And so this, in order for this to work, imagine you have these two gas clouds separated on different regions of the galaxy, they form stars. What happens is that the gas clouds will dissipate as the stars form. And similar to what's happened to our sun, as the stars go around the galaxy, they'll basically get you know, perturbed and mixed around with other things and the whole thing will just become a jumbled up mess. And so chemical tagging asserts that you can take a spectrum of these two stars and chemically tag them and find out that they're not formed together and then you can take the spectrum of these two stars and say that they were based on their chemistry. And so for chemical tagging to work, um, there are two underlying requirements uh, that have to be the case in order for tagging to work. Number one, stars born together have to be chemically homogeneous. They have to be chemically alike because that's where the chemistry is what we're using as the tag. And they also have to, then the second thing is that stars born in different locations have to be chemically different from each other so that we can tell that stars born here are different than stars born somewhere else. And if you look at the astronomy literature, there's two flavors of this. There's strong chemical tagging and weak chemical tagging. I won't really talk about those because I don't really have the time, but I just wanna at least mention it. And so one of the things that my group has been doing over the last say two to, two to three years is really answering, this, the, answering the question of whether or not stars born together are chemically identical or not, because that is it's absolutely required for chemical tagging. So, the question is, are these two stars that are born together in this binary system, are they really chemically homogeneous or not? And this can be, the answer to this can be yes or no, but it's assumed to be yes for chemical tagging and all kinds of other things in astronomy that I won't talk so much about. And so if the answer is yes, we're fine, chemical tagging works and we're good. And if it's, the answer to the question is no, well then we're in trouble. And in pops one of the um, results that happened when I was in, in a fellow in, in New York City at the Flatiron Institute, and at Columbia, um, here's the chemical abundance pattern of different elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, and so forth, for two stars, one star that's in blue and the other in, in red. Um, I've, uh, on the y-axis, you're seeing how different the stars are in chemistry. Um, and what's important here is that if these two stars are chemically exactly identical, they should, the red line and the blue line should be exactly on top of each other. That means that the difference between them, there is no difference between them. However, what we find is that in some elements, particularly the elements like magnesium and silicon and calcium, one star is enhanced at two times compared to the other. It's two times more enhanced in magnesium, for example, or iron, for example, than it's, than it's, than it's a twin star. And so these stars are fraternal in some sense, they, they're not chemically identical. And so this really, this case really called into question, does chemical tightening work or not? Um, one of the first things we did when we went, when I arrived at UT is we went out to the telescope. This is our telescope, our workhorse telescope, our 2.7 meter. Um, uh, and we got high resolution spectra. This is actually an op this is actually what our observations look like in case you've never seen what astronomers do and what it looks like to observe. This is an image of what it looks like. So these are our, our two stars that we're gonna test the chemistry of. And this is the light going down to the spectrograph. And what we found essentially um, was that by and large, we wrote this wonderful paper with 
my two graduate students and some undergraduate students, and we found that by and large, stars that are born together tend to be chemically identical. The paper that came out that said that they, those two stars were not, that seemed to be a fluke. About 10% of the time, stars are not born identical. They're born fraternal, but at least 10, 80 to 90% of the time, we think uh, stars are chemically identical. And uh, this got a lot of press in, in large part because I myself am a twin. Uh, so it was like twin astronomers studying twin stars. I'm a fraternal twin. It just happens to be that most twin stars in our galaxy are, um, are, uh, are fraternal, or sorry, identical. Okay, so that, that um, is chemical tagging. That tells us at least that chemical tagging can potentially work because at least that particular criteria is satisfied because stars born together are indeed um, identical. And so what can we do with chemical tagging? We've done already quite a lot of stuff with chemical tagging. We've used chemical tagging to understand the nature of the fastest stars in the galaxy by chemically tagging them to where they were born. Uh, this is done with a, a grant from the National Science Foundation. And uh, my group has basically been using chemical tagging, the method itself, to do all kinds of science uh, to understand the galaxy and its formation. And so taken together, the results, at least the chemical tagging results, is that chemical tagging can most certainly work. And chemical tagging, because it can work, can be used to answer all kinds of important questions about galaxy formation, um, of, uh, in particular our Milky Way, because we can backtrack where those stars came from. All right, so as I'm wrapping up, um, I just want to talk very briefly about what's next, what the future, um, what's going, what we're, what we're doing next in my group, what the future of galactic archaeology looks like. And with that, I, I want to say, you know, one of the things that we're doing now with all of these wonderful chemical abundances, we have millions of stars where we know their detailed chemical fingerprint. And so the next question is, well, what can we do with that information? And so one of the things that my group has been working with, working on, um, in collaboration with the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, is we now actually, you can now go into a planetarium and see in 3D um, our galaxy. This is an image, uh, this will be a video in a moment, but this is a, an image of a simulation of our galaxy in the background. And in the foreground, you're seeing actual real stars. Every point of light in this image is a star where we not only know its position, thanks to the Gaia spacecraft, but we also know it's detailed chemistry thanks to, thanks to this industrial revolution in stellar spectroscopy. And so for the first time, we can now beautifully see the structure of the galaxy in all of its glory. And I just wanna highlight one thing. In fact, while we're still, this is still very um, you know, spotty, you can see that there's all kinds of missing material and that's because we haven't really mapped the whole galaxy yet. We're hoping to do that. But you can already see that thick and thin disks have different chemistry. This blue area is stars that have, this is uh, color coded by magnesium. So this is how much magnesium is in the atmosphere of these stars. Blue means it doesn't have so much magnesium. Orange, yellow means it has lots of magnesium. And it turns out that the thin disk of our galaxy that's confined to the plane, that's all blue. It's not so much magnesium in those stars. But as the minute that you go out into the thick disk, you suddenly get lots and lots of, um, of green colors, lots of um, enriched star, stars enriched in magnesium. And so these maps uh, will actually, these chemical maps, you can actually fly through now in Hayden Planetarium. We're actually building a, a virtual reality version of this map. And um, you can actually put on goggles for each of the different elements on the periodic table and look for the structure. And so kind of like the first explorers went out to explore and map the world, we're now doing that uh, with the universe. And the final thing I'll say about this is that right now galactic archaeology is really confined to our own galaxy because it's really in our own galaxy where we can actually do this detailed mapping. Um, but with telescopes in the future, like the Giant Magellan Telescope that UT is a founding member of, uh, we'll actually be able to get really far out and, and see a lot more of our galaxy. And so with that, I just wanna leave you with uh, kind of thanks for listening um, and talk a little bit of, or, and, um, and leave you up with a summary of my talk and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hawkins. I think this has uh, been a wonderful talk for everyone. And um, you've all, 
always left us all thinking about uh, uh, stars and galaxies and breakfast for dinner as well. So <laughs> it's been really fun. We have a bunch of different questions coming in from YouTube. Um, so let's go ahead and have a look. I'm actually not going to pass to anyone this time. I'm just going to go ahead and get those questions up for, it, for you. Um, our first question comes from uh, Louis or Lewis, who is the halo a magnetic field? Does it protect the galaxy from the influence of other nearby galaxies? That's a very good question. Um, so the halo of our galaxy, as far as we know, is not a magnetic field and it does not protect us really from anything. Um, the galaxy does have, in and of itself, the galaxy does have a magnetic field. It's called the galactic magnetic field. Uh, but we don't think that the halo itself has a very large magnetic field. And so that cannibalistic process that I was talking about where other galaxies will um, you know, merge with our galaxy, um, that process, uh, our galaxy is going to continue to have that process happen to it. Um, we're unfortunately not protected. And in fact, um, the last image that I showed you just before I wrapped up was this beautiful image. This is Andromeda where we can start, this is our closest galaxy, our closest spiral galaxy to us where I'm hopeful that we can actually start doing chemical tagging and chemical studies in, in this galaxy, this external galaxy outside of our own. Uh, one thing to note about this galaxy though, is it's on a collision course with us and unfortunately we are not protected. So in billions of years from now, uh, this galaxy and our galaxy will merge. So nothing, nothing to worry about at the moment. Um, and uh, we've, we've got another question from Victoria. Um, this one might be a little more technical. What is the temperature of a dark cloud? Um, and presumably this was somewhat earlier on in the talk when you were mentioning all the different dark clouds. Yes, so um, many of these uh, uh, dusty regions are actually really cold. Um, and we think that they're cold in large part because uh, most of, a lot of these dusty regions are in regions that are actively starting to form new stars. And in order to form a star, you need a relatively cold environment. And so by cold, we're talking hundreds, maybe up to a thousand Kelvin, um, but not super warm. Um, if it's warm, what happens is that the gas that's in that cloud, the gas and dust, um, the particles are moving around so fast um, that they can actually stop gravity from um, pulling it together. And so many of these dark cloudy regions are regions that trace out um, cooler, uh, cooler regions in the, in the universe or in the least of the galaxy. Wonderful. And um, I've got another question from, uh, from Louis here coming in again. Um, maybe uh, one of the telescopes you haven't mentioned. Will the James Webb Telescope help in answering some of these uh, galactic archaeology questions? Absolutely. So J the James Webb Space Telescope is um, the next generation Hubble. I think it's set to launch after many delays. It's set to launch December 18th of this year. Um, and the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be fantastic for galactic archaeology. And one of the reasons why is because unlike Hubble, so the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the one that's currently up and that we all know and love, is actually primarily in the optical and in the UV, the ultraviolet. And so it sees primarily optical light that our eyes see, whereas the James Webb Space Telescope will primarily see infrared light. And that infrared light is really, really important for its peering behind dusty regions. And so the James Webb Space Telescope will do an enormous amount to not only peer into our own galactic bulge and get behind that dust, something that Hubble would really struggle doing. But in fact, it's so powerful that I've even seen several um, of my colleagues are proposing to go into the Andromeda system. This is Andromeda, our, again, our nearest neighbor, uh, spiral galaxy neighbor, rather. And you can see that they also have dusty lanes as well. And so um, James Webb Space Telescope will, again, allow us to get into Andromeda, peer into it uh, really for the first time in, in high levels of detail, um, and allow us to look at the structure of Andromeda in ways that we just haven't been able to do before. And so that James Webb will be responsible at some level for bringing galactic archaeology to other galaxies. 
Very exciting. And uh, of course, we're getting through the dust and gas definitely has a very archaeological feel here. Um, now we have another question a little bit on a different note from Ralph Chu. Uh, do all stars in a given filament or cluster have the same metallicity? Ooh, that's a very good question. So um, what I said earlier was that you have these, um, we, we're still trying to understand how stars form and whether they form in these uh, spherical uh, open clusters or if they form in these long stellar strings. Um, and it's kind of being depicted here in this video. So people have been studying the chemical abundance pattern of open clusters and by and large, they find that their metal contents are very similar. Of all the stars in, in a single open cluster, the chemical composition is very similar. Well, the strings, because they're so new, haven't been studied really before in, their, in terms of their chemistry. In fact, um, my group, actually my, my paper, uh, my 2020 paper, um, was one of the first papers that actually explored this very question. Um, this is a paper we wrote last year. And in fact, we find that most of the strings are really are also fairly homogeneous as well. They, they all the stars seem to share a pretty consistent um, abundance of chemistry, abundance of iron, for example, or abundance of other elements as well. My graduate student Catherine Manea actually uh, is writing a paper right now as we speak on this, on exactly doing this, but for all of these uh, strings that have been dis all of these new stellar strings, and we hope that that publication will be ready to go about in about a month. Wonderful. Maybe we'll have to have her back on <laughs> to talk about it. Um, so we have a, a few, a, it's been a very popular talk. We have a bunch more questions sort of trailing in. Um, I think we have time for a few more. Uh, Warren is asking, what physics make a ball form a disk, uh, black hole, galaxy, etc.? And uh, so that's going back to your, uh, your galaxy evolution, I believe. Yes. So um, the easiest way to describe this is that the physics that takes, th that allows, for example, a ball of stars to form into a disk of stars, that physical principle is called conservation of angular momentum. Um, and all it more or less says is that um, as it's, and it's kind of depicted here in this, in this video, that if you give something a spin, a little bit of a spin, if, if you start contracting it, this thing will spin up. It will continue spinning, but it will spin faster and faster and faster. And the speed, that speed of rotation, the, the forces will actually cause the thing to spin into a disk. So if you have um, a ball of Play-Doh or a ball of dough, just I encourage you to try spinning a ball of dough at some point, and you'll see that it starts to spin up. It starts to flatten out a little bit, depending on how fast you spin it. And so this, this physical principle is called conservation of angular momentum, and it's what's what we well, it is what the the Egan Lindenbell Sanders 1968 paper says is responsible for getting uh, a spiral disk in galaxy. So we've gone from making uh, pancakes and crepes to maybe pizza. Uh, <laughs> um, now, uh, from John asks an another question. Um, isn't dark matter and or dark energy key to galaxy composition? Yes. So galaxy. So uh, one thing I completely glossed over, because again, there's not enough time to talk about all the cool stuff in this one. But um, we do think that dark matter primarily is responsible for holding together. It's in some sense a, lar a large part of the glue that holds together galaxies. Um, dark matter is this material, this dark substance. We don't know what it is. Uh, but really dark matter and dark energy are just placeholder terms for our ignorance about what these things could be. Um, dark matter was discovered essentially by, if you look at the rotation of stars going around the galaxy, um, you might expect that stars at the center will be going around really fast and stars at the outer edges will be going around really slow because we see that in our own solar system. Mercury is going around the sun really fast. Pluto is going around really slow. But in fact, if you look at the galaxy, the stars in the inner parts are, um, are moving quite fast around the galaxy, but the stars in the outer parts are moving just as fast. And there's no other way. So this was, this was a great result by, um, by a, a wonderful astronomer, Vera Rubin, and what she discovered essentially is that um, stars in the outer parts of the galaxy are moving just as fast. And the only way to really do that is to add a bunch of material um, in the galaxy that we just don't see. That's called dark matter. And so we think that that 
carries a big role in how galaxies form. Uh, dark energy, probably not so much. It operates on um, probably larger scales, uh, scales of the universe. Uh, but dark matter does play a big role in terms of the formation and assembly of galaxies. It's just not something that I was able to cover in this particular talk. Yeah, we might have to leave the detailed dark matter for a slightly different day, um, but I think that does clarify it a bit. Uh, Ralph Chu has another question about the chemical tagging, actually. Uh, is chemical tagging applicable only to main sequence stars, or does state of evolution affect its results? Another very good question. So chemical tagging, again, is this process where you can tag a star to its birth location on the basis of its chemistry alone. What we do know is that, um, I'm gonna basically throw a lot of stuff under the rug, but more or less, it does not depend on evolutionary stage. It does at some level, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen does change just a little bit over the star's lifetime. But generally speaking, the rest of the elements on the periodic table don't change over the course of the star's life. I'm throwing a lot of stuff like radiative levitation and you know, atomic settling and all kinds of other things on the rug, but by and large, they generally don't change. And that's we're true whether the star is on the main sequence, whether it's a dwarf star, or whether it's evolved and it's on the, the red giant branch. Um, and so generally speaking, it does not matter whether the star, as long as you're excluding the lighter elements, it does not matter whether you're looking at um, a star at you know, a red giant phase in its evolution or a main sequence dwarf star in its evolution. Excellent. Well, I think that sort of answers the next question as well, because uh, Luis had a follow up with, could chemical differences be due to the stage of star development, um, which I th you've sort of just answered. <laughs> yes, it can, uh, but there are other things which are like things like planet engulfment. So in fact, in the Kronos Krios result that I showed from um, the paper that I showed, uh, that result shows actually that the elements that are enhanced in one of the stars are exactly the elements that go into making planets. And so they actually argue in this particular paper that um, planet accretion, that is to say the star actually engulfed and ate up the planet, uh, can also cause uh, the two stars to become uh, not chemically homogeneous. So it's not just about evolutionary stage. You can also get differences related to whether the star has eaten something in its, in its life. Well, we're on an evolutionary uh, roll here with our questions. Um, Warren has a, one that's related to this a bit. Um, so we're now we're talking about star uh, evolution. Can you uh, determine uh, how many generations of star formations have occurred since the Big Bang? So this is a very direct question. <laughs> uh, the answer to that is probably not. Um, we can determine, uh, so what people primarily do is they look at the oldest stars, the most middle part, the oldest, absolutely oldest stars. And from that, we think that they may have only been polluted by one generation of stars. Uh, and with that, you can actually, with those particular groups of stars, you can begin to assess things like how do the elements form or what does the supernova explosions that create the next generation really create? Um, but there's been so many generations from now or from the beginning of the universe until now and things are so messy that it's really hard to disentangle that number precisely. So I think the answer to that question is probably unfortunately gonna be no. Well, that's all right. I think I wouldn't be, be able to tell anyone either. Um, it's hard to be precise on that kind of scale, right? Uh, so we have a question from Ajit, maybe going back to your, your galaxy types again. This is kind of a fun one. Why don't spiral galaxies grow as big as elliptical galaxies? Ah, okay. Um, that's a good question and, and kind of hard to see in this, but the reality is, at least what we think, is that spiral galaxies, it all has to do with, with um, this the role of accretion. So we think that spiral galaxies, by and large, they have eaten things, they've cannibalized um, things, but they've spent quite a lot of time by themselves. They're, we call them rather quiescent. They're not eating a bunch of stuff all the time. And that's the, in part, at least we think, we're still not really sure, but we think that's part of the reason why they actually can grow their spiral arms because there's enough time without all kinds of messy cannibalistic things happening, violent cannibalism happening, um, where the, the, because if you start eating a bunch of stuff, you'll actually destroy your, your spiral arms. They'll get dispersed and you'll actually get things like irregular galaxies as a result of mergers. 
And so spiral galaxies likely have a slightly quieter accretion history. They're not eating as much. Whereas elliptical galaxies have, are just eating a bunch of stuff. And so that's the reason why they're elliptical and in large regards, because they've eaten a ton of stuff. So elliptical galaxies usually sit at the center of a galaxy. Well, they don't always, but um, elliptical galaxies will tend to sit inside of large clusters of galaxies in the central regions where they've kind of collected everything. And so they're really big. They're, um, and in addition to that, they also don't have spiral arms because they've been destroyed as a result of, or they, they would have been destroyed as a result of any kind of, of this cannibalistic process. Wonderful. Well, um, of course, you know, I think this goes actually quite excellently with your pancake analogy from before. So you would be rounder if you had eaten uh, that many pancakes. Um, but we have one, one last question coming in, which I think we have just enough time for. So this is again from Louis. Um, we'll round off this for our question session. But the last one, uh, does the apparent similarity of star formation hold the promise of solar systems being similar to, and therefore, holds promise for many Goldilocks Earths. Uh, very much so, in fact. Um, so uh, astronomers have done large scale studies of uh, exoplanetary systems. These are planets that are not orbiting around our own sun. And we find that um, the, the last statistic I saw was that of order every, almost every star in the galaxy probably has a planet around it or multiple planets. However, um, we have one of the things that we have found is that the diversity of solar system archetypes, that is to say, uh, the structure of, of solar systems out there are far more varied than our own. In fact, our own solar system doesn't seem so, well, we don't know how common it is, but the, the first set of systems that were discovered were hot Jupiter systems, which had a Jupiter, but they were orbiting like within days of their star. They were really close, really hot and orbiting within days. And so um, that solar system architecture uh, is really uh, varied and it doesn't necessarily seem to correlate very strongly um, with the chemistry of the star. It might, um, I think we're still trying to figure all of that out. It's a mystery in progress. Very exciting. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up here, I think. So um, thank you very, very much once again, Dr. Hawkins. I know we could certainly stay here chatting about galaxies and now solar siblings and pancakes and exploring ancient structures, uh, but we are out of time. So I'm going to say thank you once again for tonight. And with this, we will hand over officially to our president of the Toronto Centre, RASC, Tom Luton, to finish off the evening. So take it away, Tom. Thank you very much, Elena. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hope you're all doing well. So let's get going with the announcements. So as Elena said, uh, at the introduction, we've got two types of meetings. We have our recreational astronomy nights and we have our speakers nights, uh, both of which are live here on YouTube. For those of you who have joined us live, uh, thank you very much. And if you're going to come back in the future, please say hello in the chat. Enter some questions for our presenters, as other folks have been doing. If you're a new member to the center, please introduce yourself. And if you've come from someplace outside of Ontario, please let us know where you're from. So our next Recreational Astronomy Night meeting is going to be on Wednesday, the 3rd of November at 7.30 p.m. right here on YouTube. Dennis Dre will be discussing the sky this month. Darren Henning will be discussing big binoculars, prepare to be amazed. And Brian Day from NASA will be discussing NASA's solar system treks, data visualization and analysis portals. If you'd like to present something of your own, please contact Paul Markov uh, to let him know. So our next speaker's night is in one month on the 17th of November, 7.30. Dr. William Morin uh, will be discussing the geography that guides us, an indigenous perspective on our relationship to the stars, uh, right here on YouTube. Now, immediately following the meeting will be the 2021 annual meeting of the Toronto Centre of the RASC. This is a members-only event, I'm afraid. Um, as I just said, it's online on Zoom immediately after speaker's night uh, meeting. Uh, the invitations were mailed out a few days ago. You should have received them. The agenda, last year's minutes, and the slate of council candidates uh, are on our website with the link provided in the email. 
you must register for this meeting by no later than 12 midnight on the 15th of November. If you did not receive an invitation and you are a member of good standing, please contact me at president at rasktio.ca and I'll get that to you immediately. Uh, also, uh, if you would wish to join council, nominations are now being accepted. Uh, as a member, you must be a member of in good standing. The nomination form requires the signature of two additional Toronto Center members. The deadline is Wednesday, uh, November 3rd at midnight. Uh, please submit all nominations to secretary to our secretary at secretary at rasktio.ca. Coming up to the DDO on Saturday, October 23rd, 7.30 to 9 p.m., Dr. Joshua Spiegel will be discussing mapping our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the fee is $12.50. Registration uh, is required, and the links can be found on our website, rasktio.ca. Uh, the next day, on October the 24th, we have Sunday Stargazing, uh, 678 fee. Again, registry online. And then on Friday, October 29th at 8.30 p.m. is DDO Up in the Sky, $12.50 fee. Again, registration online. Now, immediately before this, also online, is the Ontario Science Centre is having a family trivia night. And if the weather behaves itself, we're going to be having members uh, will be presenting us with live telescope views. Again, weather permitting. Uh, this event is free, but again, register, you'll have to register online, and the links can be found at rasto.ca. So quite a few things are happening uh, over the next couple weeks. A little bit of a plug for our observing certificates. If you've been uh, busy taking advantage of some of the clear nights we've had in the last little while, uh, if you've almost completed, uh, or if you have completed, uh, one of our many observing programs, such as ex Explore the Universe, Explore the Moon Binocular Telescope, Messier Catalogs, Finest NGC, that's new general catalog objects, uh, Double Stars, Isabel Williamson Lunar Certificate, uh, Deep Sky Gems or Deep Sky Challenge, uh, please submit those observations to uh, www.raskca slash certificate dash programs to get your certificate and your PIN. Um, education and public outreach activities were still a little bit limited due to the pandemic, but we have been operating uh, virtual star parties, such as the Ontario Science Center one that we've I've just discussed. We've also had a few things going on at Millennium Square and the David Dunham Observatory, again, as you just uh, heard. And as well, events have been going on with St. Clair O'Connor Community, the Dunlap Institute, with various Brownies, Cubs, Scouts, school groups, and with new observers to visual astronomy. Please contact public education at rasto.ca for more information or to arrange an outreach event. Our observing sessions are still suspended until further notice. Sorry to say, due to the pandemic at Baby Village Park, Long Sioux Conservation Area, and at the Ontario Science Centre are in-person events, I should point out. Now, our club observatory, the Carr Astronomical Observatory, is open. Uh, access to CAO facilities by members and families only in a non-communal fashion. The total site occupancy is limited to 10 bookings and up to 25 individuals. Uh, one member with their family upstairs in the house and the rest are members and families that are booking for day use or using independent campers or RVs or using tents. Uh, the Sue Laura Observatory is open. The Jeff Brown Observatory is still closed. Full details are on the website. Please read everything before you make your booking. And as well, be advised that due to the oncoming winter and the lack of uh, winter maintenance on the incoming road. Um, the observatory may very well get shut down for the winter season um, with little to no notice because uh, it is in the snow belt. Um, as always, we're looking for some volunteers. 
Um, so, uh, if you'd like to help out, we are looking for an observing committee chair and committee members. We're looking for a light pollution committee chair. We are looking for some national council reps, our marketing committee chair and committee members as well. Our AV committee, who keeps working so hard to make all this wonderful uh, presentations happen, is looking for additional help. The Education and Public Outreach Committee is looking for additional members as well, especially any telescope camera, anyone who's got uh, the camera connections to act as a telescope camera operator for our virtual star parties. So contact the volunteer coordination team, volunteer at rasco.ca. Just a reminder about the joys of membership. Uh, if you'd like to renew online, uh, you can do so at secure.rask.ca. Uh, if COVID has thrown things for a loop, the RASC does have an emergency fund. It is completely confidential. And uh, also, there are gift memberships available for the coming holiday season. Um, contact national office at mempub at rask.ca. And finally, I'd like to wish everyone uh, to have a good night and thank you for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all the various forms of social media. Uh, if you like what you saw, uh, please hit the notification bell and like and subscribe. Uh, be safe, keep looking up, and have a happy Halloween. Good night.